it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Tanir Kane Muldrow. She is indeed the true embodiment of a survivor and an internationally recognized trauma-informed care expert. She's a powerful speaker and author, and I know many of you have heard her speak in the past. As I said earlier, I heard the murmurings about how excited you were to hear her again this morning. Ms. Kane Muldrow speaks from a place of authenticity and firsthand awareness. Given her experiences, she has focused her life on heightening knowledge of the characteristics and effects of trauma and improving the performance of service providers, government, business, and others who interact with trauma victims and survivors. She says, trauma blind spots distort perceptions, lead to costly mistakes, and limit the possibilities of victims and survivors. She's here to share with us her story, her struggles, and her survival, and to move us all to a higher plane. Won't you welcome, please, Tanir Kane Muldrow. Thank you. Um, let me show. Okay. Unmute me. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. So I am pleased to be here. So let me start off by saying I, um, I will be here, and then I'll um, moderate the panel. And then I have to leave, like dash back out. I was just opening up the Baltimore County Schools Conference this morning in, at Martin's West. Um, so I did the keynote, rushed here to be with you guys, and I need to go back there to close them out, because they're greedy like that, OK? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I am pleased to be here. I, I travel the world. I, I travel all around the world. I'm never, I'm never in Maryland. So it's really good that this week I have been spending so much time with providers here in Allen State of Maryland. Yesterday I was working with Andorunda County Medical Systems, um, the nurses and the, um, the emergency um, team there. So it is good to be here. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be here. You know, my story is a story of hope. I, I really, I am a vessel of hope. I take no credit for where I'm at today. There's nothing in me as a human being that could accomplish what has been accomplished in my life over the last 15 years. I give all glory to God. Let me just start off by saying that. You know what I mean? I, I'm not going to go Pentecostal on you because I'm Southern. I go to a Southern Baptist church because I only need one hour of power, okay? And so, <laughs> and then, you know, I pass the gold plate if I speak. If I get here one more amen, the gold plate coming around, I'm just saying. <laughs> so my story is a story to get you fired up again, right? You know, I grew up in the projects. Well, let me be politically correct, urban communities, you know, the hood. So we, we used to have the stove where the pilot would go out all the time. And I was always the chosen one to blow up with my mother. You know what I mean? Because you go, Nene, give me the newspaper. I didn't know back then how quick newspaper burned. <laughs> you know? So I go get the newspaper. She does, she, she ball it up, and, and she lights it, and she lights the poly because if she didn't like the poly, she couldn't cook. So I'm here to light your poly, to get you excited about your work and the work that you are going to do to let you know no matter how bad it looked, there is hope. Amen. And to let you know that you don't have the right to deem somebody hopeless. Please don't give yourself that. That is not your right. This is my belief. Nobody can change my mind. We are created in the image of the Almighty God. We are worth saving. So my story is going to get you jumped up, get that fire started. And when you leave, you're going to be like, I'm going to save a life. <laughs> At age nine, I created a belief system that I am nothing, I never amount to anything, and this is just how it's going to be for me. Thank you. I knew that some people live in these wonderful houses on the hill and have these families that hug them, love them, and protect them, and some of us just lived in an alcoholic, abusive household like mine, and that's where you stay. At age nine, I had about seven and a half brothers and sisters. Always say half because my mother was always pregnant. I never really knew where babies came from. I just knew she kept bringing them home. She would be like, I'm taking the trash out. 
And then two days later, she will come back with a baby in her arms. <laughs> Don't know what's going on at that dumpster lady, but you might want to stay away from that for a couple years, I'm just saying. And so whatever has happened to my mother that has never been identified, addressed, and treated, she, it prevented her from the natural. It is not natural to have kids and not do everything you can for them, right? That's not natural. So if something has happened to prevent that in her life. So I thought that I had to be the one to take care of my brothers and sisters. Molestation and sexual assault started very early on in my life. And I never really understood how a grown man whose body was so big that it covers my child body would find any pleasure out of hurting me. But because I had that belief system that I am nothing, I never amount to anything, there was something else that birthed out of that, and it was bad things just happened to bad people, right? So if this very, very bad thing is happening to me, that must mean I'm a very, very bad child. So I tucked it inside of me, and I didn't want to expose it, because maybe I exposed how, just how bad of a child I am. Unable to go to school a lot because I had to stay home and take care of my sisters and brothers when my mother didn't return home at night at times. She was an alcoholic. She would just go drink with her friends, just didn't come home. But after missing two and three days at a time, I would always go back to school, always giving my missed lessons, always passed off to the next grade, but nobody ever asked why. Why are you missing so many days? If there was any communication with my mother, there were no consequences because I was always just passed off to the next grade. I also started drinking alcohol around age nine. I used to wander into the living room after those last night's party, and I would find these half-filled cups still sitting around. And what I realized was when I drank these half-filled cups, when my mother was smacking me down and calling me names, it didn't feel as bad anymore. And when the men came, it didn't feel as shameful or as painful, so I would seek out these half-filled cups to help me to deal with my reality. This is a photograph of me around age nine. I, re I remember getting ready for it. We called it Free Picture Day. Because at times, she's she shaking her head already. Because at times back, you could go to school and take pictures. And they would actually send the whole pack of pictures home in hopes that somebody's going to pay. <laughs> How many of y'all got free pictures back in the day? <laughs> well, my mother's one of them people that messed that up for us because now, when my daughter get her pictures taken, they want their money before or on the day or your child not getting snapped. It's just simple as that. <laughs> so I remember getting ready. I remember washing out this red and white connector polyester shirt with a bar of ivory soap trying to get it clean after picking it up off a pile of dirty clothes that we also use for toilet paper. Getting a straight part to make these two perfect ponytails and brushing my teeth. I brush my teeth a lot, not because my mother said brush in the morning after every meal, or because she would take us to the dentist. She's never taken us to the dentist. I brushed my teeth a lot because in my mind, my child's mind, I thought, if only I could brush away the smell of the men when they used to force themselves in my mouth or around my face, if I could just brush the smell. See, no matter how much I brush my teeth, no matter how much I wash my face, the smell always seemed to be there. So I would brush and brush and brush, but I didn't know anything else about any other hygiene, how to properly wash myself and clean myself. So my nickname in elementary school was Pissy Neen because I always smelled like urine. Well, I had a whole bunch of babies sleeping on me at night. Somebody would always pee on me. I would wake up in the morning, run into the bathroom, take an old beat of toothbrush, stick it in a box of baking soda, and brush and brush and brush. But I didn't know how to take care of myself otherwise. So when I would get to the schoolhouse, the kids would circle me and call me Pissy Neen. I would break through the circle, go into the bathroom, huddle down and cry. The teacher would come and get me, start today's lesson, but again, never ask why. Well, eventually, there was a complaint filed against my mother with the Department of Social Services around age 11. And when the social worker walked into our apartment, seeing the filthy conditions we were living in, she immediately removed us from the household. And as you good folks know, there's not one family sitting around waiting to foster so many kids together, right? So we were separated, and we was put into different foster care homes, and I was devastated. It was my sisters and brothers that gave me the only joy I had in my life was to be surrounded by them. You know, I know our Child Protective Service um, were created to protect the child physically, but it has done very little to protect the child emotionally and psychologically because the process of snatch and place totally disregards children. The only thing that this lady could tell me when she put me in her little white car was, don't cry. It's going to be OK. What's going to be OK? What are you talking about? I don't know why it's so hard for us to, to treat children like they're a part of this process and say, you must be scared out of your mind. 
I am so sorry this is happening to you, your brothers and sisters, even to your mother. I'm about to take you to a total stranger's house, somebody you never met probably before in your life. But we believe that this is the best family to take care of you while we try to figure this out with your mom and get you back as soon as possible, if possible. But instead of that, she said, don't cry. It's going to be OK. And the next day, they sent me to school like nothing ever happened. And they were getting reports like this. She doesn't focus well. She doesn't keep up with the class. We think she may have some learning disability. No, you turned the only world I had upside down, and you did not help me with this transition. You made it even worse for me. But thankfully, I was only in foster care for a short period of time. I had a family member who chose me, and she had three daughters around my age. And for the first time in my life, I felt a little safe because nobody was teasing me and nobody was touching me. She fed me. She sent me to school on time. She showed me how to wash myself and clean myself. And I felt so safe that I even tried out for the school play. And yet there's more black people in Annapolis, Maryland than me. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the production world, we call it tight cast, OK? <laughs> you know what I mean? So when I felt safe, they became my family. And I felt comfortable. Yeah, that's me. That's, that's a little black me right there. <laughs> I, I, I know. Yeah, that's not the curtain. That's me. <laughs> but unfortunately, within three years of being with my cousin, my safe cousin, my mother came back and she told me she loved me. Up until that point in my life, I have never remembered hearing my mother tell me she loved me. So I didn't hesitate. I ran upstairs. I packed my things. And off into the sunset, I went with my mother. Because that's what children do. They love the people they're supposed to love unconditionally. But by then, she had had three more kids. Social service had given her even more benefits in another public housing apartment. Within a week, she beat me in the street. I realized she didn't want me back because she loved me. She needed a babysitter. So how do I live with her? And I don't want to live without her. And I remember somebody saying, if you take a bottle of pills, you'll die. Well, in hopes of dying, I took a whole bottle of pills. And when I woke up in the emergency room with them trying to get the tube down my throat to get the charcoal in my stomach, I could see them talking to my mother off to the side who convinced them that I took an accidental odor on my own prescribed medication. I was released right back into her care. She didn't know what to do with me at that point. So she sent me to live with her sister, who did the very best she could. But by age 15, I was an alcoholic. In order for me to stay in school, I had to sip on gin and juice all day long. And it still gave my mother some control over my life. So when this man was eight years older than me, he thought I was cute and wouldn't mind making me his wife. And he befriended my mother by giving her all the alcohol she could possibly drink. So when it came time for her to sign the marriage license on my behalf, she signed it. I married him. I moved into his home. She moved in with my three little sisters because she had been evicted again. OK. Maybe this older man can protect me from all the other bad men of the world. But this night in shining armor, there was times when I would see his headlights from his pickup truck shining through the living room window when he returned home at night. I was often frozen in fear because I didn't know if this going to be the night that he decided to come in, take his finger after been drinking all night, swipe his finger. Because if there was dust on his finger, he was going to beat me until he seen blood. Because what he needed to know was what was I doing all day long that I could not dust his house. So there were many beatings in that regard. So when someone came to me around age 19 and said, try this, it was crack cocaine. It was the answer to all of my problems. See, I could just use this drug and numb out anything that ever happened to me. That smell that wouldn't go away, when I used that drug, that smell went away. But there was also a movie that had been developing in my mind over the years. You know the movie of the big man that covered my child's body? And while he was hurting me, he had his elbow up against my mouth so I wouldn't scream. That movie stopped playing when I did this drug. But unfortunately for me, in order to obtain this drug to help me to deal with my reality, I had to do some things. So yes, I stand before you with a criminal record of 83 arrests and 66 convictions. They told me I was going to spend the rest of my life going in and out of prison or I was going to die in the streets. When I would leave a facility, they said, see you when you come back, Canaan. When I always came back, they said, welcome home. You want your old cell? You want your old rubber room? <laughs> Nobody ever said, I really hope you give yourself a break. 
I still didn't understand what was wrong with me, though, because people kept calling me crazy. They, got, they start calling me crazy mean. So I would check myself into our 72-hour voluntary mental health unit at our county hospital. And it depended upon what day of the week it was. If I went on a Wednesday, I was schizophrenic. If I went on a Monday, I was bipolar. If I went on a Tuesday, borderline Tuesdays. <laughs> they will always give me a different diagnosis. And I will always ask, well, how do you know? I will explain to the psychiatrist that I had been up for seven days straight smoking crack cocaine. So they never allowed the street narcotics to get out my system before they truly gave me assessment or evaluation. But I guess you get what you pay for because I ain't have no insurance. They didn't have open and okay. <laughs> that was funny in 2016. Hopefully it'll be funny again in 2020. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is my very first mugshot. I, can I have a good relationship with the police department now. We real, we real cool now. As a matter of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact, one of the detectives he just retired. Well, him and I, we very, very, very good friends. Right now he's in Italy, but we're very good friends. Um, the reason why we became good friends because he was so amazed. Of Amazed about the advocacy work that I was doing in the streets where I did all my dirt. I just went back to the streets, reaching down, helping people. That's it. The reason why he was amazed because when I was when he was a street officer, he was one of the officers that used to arrest me all the time, so he knew my history. So he would call me up um, to let me know if something was going on with one of the women he knew I was trying to mentor off the streets. And I compared this to a young lady that I've been um, mentoring over the last several years. So he called me up one night, 11.45. Let me just say this. If you guys know somebody that used to smoke crack and they don't smoke crack anymore, 11.45 is considered late. Let's just say that right now, OK? <laughs> you don't call me quarter midnight. I'm going to be like, you normal people now. I ain't smoking no more. You know, he called me, and I'm answering the phone. You know how you pissed off somebody answer, calling you, and you want them to know about it. Well, you answer to, hello? Like they can see your head. Hello? And he was like, hey, Tony, I want to know if you can come down to the detention center at the booking unit. And I said, hell no. You know what I mean? You just don't call somebody up and be like, come to jail. Who does that? You know? You know? I mean, really, is the budget really that bad now where they're just calling people up on the phone, telling them, look, gas price is high this week. Chief only letting us take out two cars tonight. You know we're going to eventually get you anyway. I want you to jump on the public bus and turn yourself in. Oh, by the way, Chanel, we ran out of film, so if you got a picture of yourself, bring that too. <laughs> I've never been that type of person that turned themselves in or even show up to court. It just never really seemed like a win-win situation for me. So. But he goes on and says, no, Tony, we have Vicki. I know you've been trying to mentor her off the streets. We just arrested her on a major charge. Come down and support her. So I, I go down to the detention center. I go in the back in the security unit, and I'm watching them process her. You know, she was crying so much they had to re-fingerprint her. She was fainting, excuse me, she was faking the fainting. Because you know, when we get arrested, we know how to faint on a drop of a dime. <laughs> I actually know how to stop my vital signs and everything, hoping that this can change their mind. It never works. Don't try it at home. It never works. But I'm watching, I'm watching them process her. She's taking these officers through all that. And I think back to my very first major charge. Even at a young age, I didn't seem distressed at all. I said, maybe I thought in my mind somebody would finally ask me what happened to you instead of what is wrong with you? Why can't you get it together? Maybe I feel safe. Maybe I get the help I need. Now, I don't want to talk to you real briefly about being re-traumatized in the multiple systems I've been in. Let me start off by saying this. This is my own personal story. This is not a personal tag for anyone in your profession. We cool? Yeah. This, this presentation is based on my life story the movie, the book about my life, and stories I created to bring a point. That's it. It's my story. You know, unless you was a provider 15 years ago in Anne Arundel County, or oh, we still may have some issues. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Annapolis. I, 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 I lived in Annapolis all my life. I just recently moved to Bowie over the last couple of years. But I'm from Annapolis. Everybody know Annapolis is downtown. You know, we don't have like a tremendously high crime rate. We, we, our gang activity just started a few years ago. You know what I mean? So it's a pretty decent town. But it still have all these issues. It's still a town where we had drug addiction, pr prostitution, all of the things that we have within the urban communities, right? So, but we have one police department. We do not have districts. We're into Bermayburg. Let me say that. 
So the same officer, was, the officers that was arresting us was the same officers all the time. So I had made a deal with these two guys once, and the deal was this. If you give me this certain amount of crack cocaine, I'm going to perform these sexual acts for you. Well, when we walked around the abandoned building where all this was supposed to play out, they cornered me and they said, you're going to do this, this, and this, and we're not going to give you anything. So after they made me do everything I said I was, that they said I was going to do, they stomped me, they beat me, they stomped me down, they spit on me, and they left me there. So when I was able to get up and come from around the building, I seen a police standing against this cruiser. And when he seen me, he said, oh, well, Miss Kane, we've been looking for you because I had a failure to appear warrant for something. And I'm walking over to him, I beat up very badly. He grabbed my arm, threw it around my back, and threw me against the police cruiser, and it broke my nose over top of everything else. I said, it really couldn't get past it. Where did I look or where did I smell? However, I was a 30-day repeat offender. Every 30 days, I was either going in correction, mental health, or some substance abuse program. This one particular time, I went into the detention center. I told them I was pregnant. They took my urine, got my urine mixed up with somebody else, told me that I was not pregnant, but I had a urinary tract infection. And they medicated me as if I had this infection that they insisted on. And I took the medicine every four hours when the nurse came around. I had to go to court one morning. I went to use the bathroom. My baby head came out. I was five months pregnant. They shackled me down to the gurney and threw a sheet on the bottom half of my body with my deceased baby stuck between my legs while they tried to figure out who was going to escort me to the emergency room. I tell you this awful story for one reason. So often we see people come back and forth into our system and our program on our caseloads. And we so easily and rarely make up our mind that everything they say is a lie. We manipulate. We seek some attention. Not for one moment in this whole facility, this medical department, did anybody say, hold up. Maybe this woman knows more about her body than we're allowing her. Maybe we should retest her just to make sure we're not wrong. It could have been prevented. Here where it may get a little tricky. Are there any public defenders here? <laughs> Anybody was a public defender in their past life? Anybody want to be one in their next life? Where I come from, and my experience with public defenders is this. You didn't see them until the morning of court, so we called them public pretenders. And they will always come to court with a whole bunch of files. Nothing will be inside your files. But on the front up there in that, that corner on those black lines, you have your name, your age, your race, and how many kids you have. That is your defense no matter what your crime is. Around my 40th arrest, the state is reading off my record. Possession, possession, paraphernalia, prostitution, theft, prostitution, possession, violation, possession, paraphernalia, theft, paraphernalia, possession, possession. So the judge says, hmm, does this young lady have a drug problem? <laughs> My public defender. Probably like, he must have went to the same school I went to. He <laughs> said, so a court ordered me to a 28-day substance abuse program right here in Baltimore City. 28 days was just enough time for me to get some rest and figure out how I was going to get high again. This was after 16 years of drug addiction, even longer alcoholism. And they all did the same thing. It would, tell, it would take us a whole week to tell us what we better not do. They had this one rule and regulation called the buddy system. So this is how she said, <laughs> this is how the buddy system works. When you arrive to the program, they buddy you up with somebody else in the program. Here is why I had an issue with this. Hold up, sir, come back. She smoked crack too. <laughs> so at the end of the day, we talk, we talk each other into getting high. I'm jumping the fence to help pulling her over, so you're going to lose two instead of one. Around the second week, they start to give us a drug education course. They want us to know the natural names of the drugs that we're putting in our system. Around the third week, they would show us pictures of unsafe homemade utensils. Please tell the word unsafe, because as addicts, that is our number one concern is safety, OK? <laughs> and finally, before you graduate, they tell you how it affects your brain. I don't need to know what it used to be called. I need to know what it's called now. See, when that smell come back, to feel like it's going to choke the life out of me. I need to go get it and get it quickly, because if I don't, I'm probably going to blow my brains out. Know how to get it in my system safely. That's why I'm in your drug program. And who cares how it affects my brain? Tell me how to live a different life, how not come back and forth into the system. But this first quarter, court order program, I felt like there was a glimmer of hope. Because I seen people, they look good, they sound good, so I got excited. And they told me I had to see the intake worker. 
And she said, Miss Kane. And she waved me in the office. And this is what this lady did. She said, have a seat. She said, Miss Kane, have you ever been a victim of domestic violence? I said, lady, every man I had went upside my head. She said, is that a yes? <laughs> and, she, and she just checked the box. And then she said, well, Miss Kane, have you ever been a victim of sexual abuse? I said, lady, I've been beaten and raped so many times, I stopped counting them. She checked the box on this one-page form, saved it inside a file, filed it away, never to be seen again. After telling this woman all the suffering and violence by the hands of men all my life, I was assigned a male counselor. Let me tell you something. You don't get anything else out of my presentation. Please get what I'm about to tell you. You guys ready? Come on, you ready? Because don't make me become the minister. I really am going to be like, tap your neighbor, tap your neighbor. Because I can go there. You don't see the anointing now. You will by the end of my presentation. <laughs> Trust me, you're going to see more of God and less of me by the end of this. I promise you that. When we come into your programs, when we come into your facilities, when we end up on your case, so guess what? We come with the hope that you know what you're doing. Half of us don't have the willingness or the desire to wake up day after day. So when we hobble through those doors, broken in spirit, in mind, in body, we expect you to know what you're doing. So if you tell me that this man is the best thing for me, who am I to argue? You're the experts. You are. So I was complying in this program. I graduated. And even though they deposited me right back into my drug-infested neighborhood, I still stayed clean that first week. I couldn't believe it. I went to aftercare. They said, keep coming back. Don't stop before the miracle. I went back home, stayed clean another week, two weeks in the same drug-infested neighborhood. I was able to get a ride to aftercare, but I couldn't get a ride from aftercare. My drug counselor, who I was assigned to in this program, I was court-ordered, and he offered me a ride home, but he made a pit stop to pull me out. His car pushed me down, and he raped me from behind. And when he pulled me up by my hair, he said, no sense telling anybody. You're just a cracker. You're just a prostitute. You're nothing. And he threw me to the ground. I'm not making excuses for this man, but still, if we truly understand the impact of trauma, up to 92% of incarcerated girls has been exposed to emotional, physical, sexual abuse. Given my answers to the intake form, just maybe, just maybe, a male counsel wasn't the best thing for me after all. He has been held accountable for his actions. Always, always put into seclusion and restraints. I was that angry, out of control inmate and shoot up with more medicine mental patients. That was me. One of the worst things you can do to somebody that's a victim of neglect and abandonment is put them in a the room, shut the door, and walk away. Because my issue with my mother was always triggered. And nobody's helping me to identify, address, or treat my trauma. So I do the only thing that I know to do, and that is to tap into my survival mode. And my survival mode has always told me to fight because I didn't know there was any other way. It is hot. And, you know, it, it's hot in here. I'm sorry. I am so glad that I get to find out where he is so I can live right. So I ain't got to find out what eternal he is, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm always for the seclusion research. And they will come with the tray of medicine. I smack it on my face, and now they're on a walkie talkie calling the code. People are running towards me, usually men. Do you truly understand? They were coming to restrain me. They're to restrain a rape victim, somebody that has been held down and raped multiple times, causing more traumas, layers and layers of it, taking me even further away from the possibility of healing or recovery. Not intentionally, I know, but because, we, again, we don't understand the impact of trauma. We sometimes, oftentimes, cause more harm. Always, always over-medicated. And truthfully, I'm going to keep it real. I actually appreciated the free high. You know, I wasn't one of the people like, I don't want your medicine. I'm like, where the nurse? She's late. She's late. <laughs> But unfortunately for me, for bipolar disorder, they would give me Thorazine, Ativan, and Lithium at the same time. Somebody please help me hold my head up so I can have the drool out the corner of my mouth. Again, make it impossible for me to heal. As a result of rape or prostitution, my children were conceived. I never knew all but my first child. I never knew if my children, father was my rapist or my trick, but they were my children. And they were rightfully so removed from my care, rightfully so. I would try to go visit my children. They said, no, Miss Kane, you lost parental rights. And I asked, can I see two of my kids once? Because I was thinking, if only I had the opportunity to put their heartbeat against mine one last time and whisper in their ears, I'm so sorry. Maybe one day they'll be able to feel my love, since I couldn't show it. 
So she told me when to come back. She said, I'll let you see your kids one last time. And by then, I was a wino, the type of wino that sit in front of the liquor store at 6 o'clock in the morning begging for some change to get a paint of wine to get the shakes off. But I decided this morning, I'm not going to sit in front of the liquor store. I'm going to, um, I ducked into the bathroom. I put soap in my mouth, underneath my arm, tried to smell the best I can for my kids because I just needed to put their heartbeat against mine. And when I arrived to the Department of Social Services, they put me in a room. The light came on on a one-side mirror. They allowed me to watch my children with their new mom. They couldn't see me, but I could see them. I wasn't getting the opportunity to, 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 to say I'm sorry or put their heartbeat against mine. When I left there, she gave me this. She put this in my hand. She said, this is the last piece of communication you'll ever get from us. This is a closed adoption. Do not contact us again. So I went deep, 19 years, living in the streets, eating out of a trash can, prostituting, not allowed to go in anybody's house, being told and treated by the system that there was just no hope for Tanir King. I put this one in for two reasons. For 19 years living as a crack addict, I had really nice teeth, OK? <laughs> <laughs> right? 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 Look at those pearly whites, right? <laughs> so when we was getting the footage of uh, the film about my life, I had a camera crew that followed me for 20 months. And so we went underneath the bridge where I spent a lot of my time, and my toothbrush and toothpaste was still there. I would get pat down by a police officer. They said, is that a weapon? I said, no, that's my toothbrush. Get my toothbrush. <laughs> I always had to brush my teeth no matter what. And out of all my mug shots, it was a perfect time for intervention. 15 years ago, I'm back down at Maryland Correctional Institution for Women for a violation of parole and a whole bunch of other new charges. And I'm pregnant again. And I'm terrified I'm about to lose another baby. And I don't know how I'm going to live through having another baby snatched from my arm. See, I got used to the beatings and the rape. So used to it. I said, put your gun, put your knife away. Just hurry up so I can get back to what I need to do. I got used to that. But what I couldn't get used to is somebody taking my child out of my arms, turning their back, and walking away. So here I was in prison, ready to have my child taken away from me once again. And something dropped in my spirit. Or maybe I remember somebody saying it, but it was like, if all else fail, why not look up to God? And I laid down in my, in my cell, in my concrete floor, on that concrete floor, and I cried out to God. I don't call it a prayer, but it was an eerie cry of desperation. I said, God, I don't know if you listen to people like me, but if you do, please help me. Please don't let them take this one. And after I found out about this program, I mean, after that prayer, I found out a program that said, it will work on my trauma, my addiction, my mental health, my recovery. I really think these people can help me at this point after 31 other failed treatments. No. But they said you get to keep your baby with you. And I, and I was thinking if I can hold on to this one for more than three hours. So I wrote a request to go to this program, and it came back stamped that I, I was ineligible for this program because you had to be eligible for parole to go. And just so happened I was in prison for violation of parole. They do not want to have that conversation. And, but um, the Tamar team, even though the warden said, no, she's going to stay here and do her time, she, they would always stop by to say hi to me when they came, when they interviewed other pregnant inmates for the program. I worked in the library because I was pregnant. And they told me one day, you don't have enough time to there. You're going to get released in November. I said, yes, but I'm going to have my baby in August. Even if I could find somebody to keep my baby from August to November, what am I going to do, take underneath the bridge for me? I said, wait a minute, I need to go to court for one more charge. What if I go to court and ask the judge for more time? They took that back to the warden. The warden said, if she actually goes into court and asks the judge for more time out of her mouth, I'm going to personally find a way for her to go to the program. So the night before court, I'm all excited because I'm going to get me some time. I couldn't even sleep. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, they say, court ladies, I was already up and dressed. And when they put me on the van, they handcuffed me to another young lady. So I'm handcuffed to somebody the whole time on the van. And she had my arms stretched out like this, because you know when we go court from prison, we become very religious people. So she in prayer mode. The whole van was singing in gospel. The whole van was Jesus, hallelujah. Same people that cussed me out the night before, but I'm like, okay, do you? Everybody had a, everybody had a rosary on. Wasn't nobody Catholic on the whole van. <laughs> Did nobody even know what the rosary was for? I did not hear one Hail Mary. I did not. <laughs> and thank goodness for those prison ministry people that give the New Testament Bibles for court. So that, they had their Bibles. They had their crosses. I don't have to do none of that. I'm going to get me some time. Deputy, I got to the, to the 
courthouse. I said, Deputy, Deputy, who's the sitting judge today? When he yelled back who the judge was, I could have passed out. I've been trying to get in front of this judge for years because he do not like to give out time. When I need time, I get this man. <laughs> Everybody give me high fives. I was like, Jesus, hallelujah. <laughs> let, me, let me get that cross real quick. I'm going to need that today. Because I was in my eighth month of pregnancy. I knew if I gave birth in prison, given my history with child protective sir, I'd never get my daughter back. But I asked for time. He gave me time, and I was able to go to the program. And when I walked through the door to take my children, somebody greeted me and said, I'm so glad you're here. After 19 years of people shaking their head in disgust, telling me that I wasn't going to be able to heal, I wasn't going to ever get better. And I started to work with my trauma therapist. She worked on my neglect and abandonment issues. So I was able to begin healing in that. All the times I was emotionally, physically, and sexually abused. We talked about every incident and assault that I could remember. And then she said, we're going to talk about your children. I said, how can I heal from something that continues to give me pain? Every day that I wake up, I realize I have four kids pet walking this earth. If I passed them in the streets, I wouldn't even know it. How do you heal from that? She said, you do. You just don't do it by yourself. And now I was in a safe environment. And I was getting all the help that I needed. And I was believed in everything. So I was able to begin healing and go through a grieving process of four kids at the same time. So people over the 19 years tried to give me bits and pieces of information. But it only get surfaced. You know, I seen the commercial. Y'all remember the commercial, this is your brain on drugs? I was a homeless crack addict. When I seen that commercial, I wanted an egg sandwich. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? And remember how fresh the egg looked? So the bits and pieces of information only get surfaced. I had so much pain, so much trauma, packed so tight. The bits and pieces of information couldn't penetrate any of that to get rooted so I can build a foundation so my belief system can change from I am nothing to I am somebody and I can be anything I want in this world. It is when my belief system changed that my thought process changed. And I started to make the best decisions in my life. And the best decision I ever made was to go through a one-year course and guess what? How to be a mother. Yeah. Because if you don't know, you just don't know. My learned behaviors is from my mother. So I had to learn how to be loving and nurturing and protect. And I can tell you, my daughter's 14 now. She has a secure attachment. That's a whole different traumatic experience being a mother of a teenager. I, it blows my mind. I'm like, I have never been victimized so much in my life. <laughs> really? I'm like, all the bees and rapes did not prepare me for this. You know what I mean? Like, really? But she's 14. She's about to go into high school. My daughter, um, she has tested in the high school centile in our nation for several years for the National Standardized Test. She's been taken, for instance, first grade four times a week, so she's almost fluent in French. She's like this just really, really smart kid, and she's, but she's still a teenager. Uh, <laughs> but what a difference it made in her life. They treated my trauma with the whole fast out there system, and it worked. But I often wonder, did they realize that treating my trauma was going to break that generational cycle in my family? See, my daughter doesn't know what it's like not to be hungry, not to be like, she goes to the best private, rated the best private school in Maryland, the key school. So yes, I am living the American dream. I'm in debt. There you have it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so they used to kept taking pictures of me and my daughter uh, while we was in the program. I didn't understand why are they keep randomly showing up, taking pictures. And they would show us these pictures, and they, this is of me with my daughter and while I was still in the program. And when I see that, seen that picture, I knew things were changed. So she, I was able to form a secure attachment and maintain the attachment. Um, Fifteen years ago, I cried out to God to help me. I never had another desire to use drugs, alcohol, or even smoke a cigarette. It's been 15 years without one desire. <laughs> Those of you that know him like I know him, we call that deliverance, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm no longer on psych psychotropics, even though I had some girlfriends be like, girl, you might want to rethink that thing from time to time <laughs> and get yourself. I graduated the program. The program was in Park Heights Avenue in a drug-infested neighborhood, the program that I went to. I graduated the program in 2005, and I went into my own little apartment in, in Baltimore County with my little mice. Me, my daughter, and, and the community of mice that I had. But I was so grateful to have this opportunity. But they did not just put me in an apartment and expect me to know how to be a homemaker. They did. They taught me how to create a budget. I said, lady, I get a welfare check. How you budget that? She said, you do. 
They told me how to open up a check account, how to pay bills. They said I had to pay BGE. I thought it was a drug deal I owed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> to come to find out, it was Baltimore Gas and Electric. Who kind of is like a drug dealer, but you know what I mean? But you know. <laughs> but they didn't assume. And because I had somebody to do that for me, within 18 months of graduating drug program, I built my own home. And it was, it was such a big deal back then, Baltimore Sun. It was such a big deal, Baltimore Sun ran around like a four-page article. I think one of the hittings were crackhead bills a house. <laughs> <laughs> the wonders of the world. <laughs> I'm, today, I am CEO and founder of four different companies. I have many employees and programs and things like that. Thank you. I'm an award-winning film and TV producer. Um, we have several films that we produce. We have one of our new films, that is the, we have two new films that's coming out. One is called Walking Through Bullets, a gang-related film. And then we have another one that is um, called The Unseen Village, which is a film that I filmed in Nigeria last year um, about the girls um, returning to the village after being kidnapped by Boko Haram. So we, um, we have two amazing, amazing um, films, that new TV show that's about to hit air called Restoration. We're excited about that. We're going to be filming some of that in Baltimore City as well. So we're excited about that. Um, also, I just was awarded my own talk show. So, yes. Yeah. So. I will be actually in the studios next week to start shooting um, a couple first episodes. So everything that, every, all of my content is inspiring, uplifting, and give hope. Work with a lot of different networks, got a lot of different people in some very, very high places that we are just doing tremendous things that impact the world, that impact the world. This is my production company. So whenever you see that logo in credits, you'll see, y'all going to be like, yes, that's that crackhead knee. Y'all not, <laughs> not going to say to me or Kane. Y'all going to be like, you remember that crackhead that spoke at our conference? I just seen her logo on this TV show. <laughs> I said from jail, jail to Yale. Right here is a picture of me giving a lecture at Yale Law School. I travel the world. I'm known in 100 countries for my work. Um, and do my films, my book, my speaking, and educating. I'm the former team leader for the National Center for Trauma and Informed Care. So I'm considered one of the leading experts in our nation on it. I'm an author. Um, this Relationships After Trauma is a, it's our new guidebook that I um, developed to help people work through their trauma and develop some healthy tools. That is pre-order now and can be available. It'll be shipped out in August. But and then the study guide for the film Healing Need, and then all of my training manuals that we use to train the um, providers around the world on trauma-informed care. There is no black people in South Dakota other than me that day. <laughs> I was, I was trained. I go to South Dakota almost every year to train the Supreme Court system and the, the court system. They, they always make me come in November, December, which is the cruelest thing ever. They invite me to South Dakota, but that is them holding up my book. They brought 500 copies of it. This is my daughter. Last year, she uh, won the Humanities Award, um, the, the book, The Letters of a Congress. She came in second place in the state of Maryland, 1,800 submission and 60,000 in the nation. Yeah. Her, award came, her award came with cash. I get awards all the time. <laughs> Mine don't come with cash. So, one of the most difficult relationships I ever had was being married. I don't like being married most days. It has nothing to do with my husband. He's an amazing man. It has nothing to do with him. What, it, it has something to do with the fact that I am a survivor of domestic violence and sexual abuse. So I'm triggered all the time. My husband had to learn how to be rejected over and over again until I was able to find healthy tools, you know what I mean, to self-soothe and self-regulate so it wouldn't impact him in a negative way. It takes work, but it can be done. And when we, we, our, our marriage is on the rock of Jesus Christ. So we do a lot of prayer, you know. And so it, a lot of relationships that you have to, trauma survivors have to go through, man. It's just, we're supposed to live on life terms, but as a trauma survivor, it's a lot different. It's a lot harder for us. 
you know, especially those of us that are children of God, because the Word of God tells you one thing, and the world says, reclaim your body. And the Word of God says, oh, no, no, your body not yours no more. You can't deny your husband. I'm like, huh? And you know how when you don't want to do what God said you want to pretend it's Old Testament? <laughs> you want to be like, you want to say, that's when we couldn't eat pork. That's before the blood. You know, no, that was the New Testament, so just learning how to live life on life terms. So what if at age nine, somebody recognized my trauma, I had the opportunity to embrace trauma treatment. The school employees and everybody was trained, help, was trained in how to deal with me. Isn't it possible that this woman could become, that child could become this woman? This is Marilyn Mosby, State Attorney Marilyn Mosby, um, presented me with a citation for some work to, um, for appreciation for some work um, that I do in the nation and in Baltimore City around trauma-informed care. We're actually opening up a trauma house in Baltimore, and we're building a whole wellness center. Um, so we're excited to bring that to Baltimore City. <laughs> this is me in Belize, Georgia, not the state Georgia, but the country over top of Turkey. Last year, I was asked to come and give a keynote presentation on the need for people to access legal aid in the criminal justice system for free around the world. So I presented to 60 dignitaries from 60 different countries last year, um, impacting 60 countries at one time. Three of my four kids has been restored to my life. That's my youngest son giving me away at my wedding. So what if this woman was yet again in your program, in your system, on your case though? 83 arrests, 66 convictions, 19 years of drug addiction, being um, diagnosed mentally ill. In the past, would you be able to look at her just like that? Be honest, community member, family member. 83 arrests, 66 convictions, 19 years, lost all her kids. Here she come again. Would you truthfully be able to look at her and imagine me today? Truthfully, do we truly believe in the people that we serve? This is my belief. Nobody can change my mind. We are created in the image of the Almighty God. We are worth saving. We are worth saving. So would you be able to look at her and imagine her on the red carpet in Hollywood ready to receive an award for her work? Where there's breath, there's hope. Remember, when you make somebody feel safe, they will be empowered. They'll start to see that they're worthwhile, and they'll be able to become the survivor. Always remember, no how bad it is, no matter how bad it looks, where there's breath, there's hope. Treat the trauma. You will get different results. I'm your evidence. Thank you. nothing to say after that. So I am not even going to try, except that you are amazing. That's simply amazing. And for you to share, not just today and with us, can't hear back there, okay? Not just today and with us, but across the world. I mean, your story, and it gives, a, we, I said I wasn't going to try and here I'm talking. I hate when people say, you have anything to say? No, and then they start talking, and I'm doing it. But you deserve it, and thank you so much because you have embodied the things that we have begun to talk about, which is learning and understanding about someone's trauma and knowing what you've said. Never give up on someone, and there's a way to intervene and to do something for somebody. So thank you ever so much for that presentation. <laughs> Tanir talked about her publications, and when you came in, you got a raffle. There will be some raffles at the end of the day for a signed copy of her book, Healing Mean. It is, as she is, a powerful yeah. read, I tell you. So you'll want to be here for that. <laughs> got to be here to win. All right, let me just quickly uh, move us on to the youth and young adult panel that Tanir will uh, lead for us. We have several brave young people who have agreed to come and share their stories, their triumphs, their struggles with us. It's all very personal, and I know that so many of you raised your hands right at the beginning and said, yes, we work with children, so you'll know how to receive them, I'm sure, correct? Yes? All right. 
All right, so I'll call their names and they'll come forward. We're talking first names only. The first is Leo. Leo is a high school graduate, and I am happy, wait, wait, wait. I am happy to tell you. He's a high school graduate, but guess what? In the fall, he is going to the University of Virginia on a full scholarship. <laughs> Kyrie is 19. She's a college student, and she is studying psychology in order that she can assist young teens as well who are enduring their own personal struggles. So Kyrie. I do know a little bit about this young lady because I visited um, one of her support networks recently. Shantae is a rising high school senior, and she's got, she's got her network here with her today. Um, she has experienced unbelievable familial loss um, in recent times, and she may talk to you about that. Danita is 15. Here she comes from the back. She attends Douglas High School. She's here to talk to us uh, about her life, but I will tell you that little Birdie told me that she has an incredible artistic gift, and someone may just want to ask about that. I'll leave that teaser out there. And Mike is another artist. I met Mike earlier today. Uh, Mike appeared for two seasons on The Wire and has since written a series of short films about issues related to ad uh, addiction and homelessness in... <laughs> city communities. So it's look like I don't know what I'm doing. That's exactly what you see. <laughs> I, I just kind of let you know. So, you know, they just kind of, you know, some people just throw stuff up in a contract, just all willy-nilly, like, we weren't at the panel. Like. So it is. It's a pleasure to be up here to moderate this, for, um, to spend some time with you guys this morning, make sure and have the audience be able to act. Um, do we have a, an order? No. Okay, see. Oh. Well, I mean, I think it's important that we at least have everyone introduce themselves and tell a little bit about themselves. So let's start there. Leo, since you hit the table first, you tell us um, Tell us who is Leo? Hello, everyone. My name is Leonardo Acosta. I am actually one of 11 children. Uh, my Father has married six times, and uh, my mother was the fifth wife. So that's a little context about me. Uh, I just graduated high school, and I will be attending university uh, through my own perseverance and help through my, with my guidance counselor who helped me uh, socially and academically uh, get through everything. Hi, um, my name's Kyrie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a single parent house home with the help of my amazing mother and my family and a great support system through my schools. And um, yeah, I am currently studying psychology. So. Awesome, awesome. Hi, my name is Shanae. I know it has a T in it, T is silent. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, I'm a rising 12th grader at Benjamin Franklin High School. Uh, I do a lot in my community with the help of the well, drink at the well. And I would like to think I'm a rising citizen of the community. That's right, that's right. Hello, my, hello, my name is Donita. Um, I'm 15 going on 16. I'm uh, in high school. I go to Frederick Douglass High School. I'm in 11th grade. I was supposed to skip, but I decided not to. I have good oh, grades awesome. on the roll. Um, I play <laughs> basketball. Uh, Okay. Hey, why are you doing again? Um, <laughs> my name is Mike Wills. Um, if you guys ever heard about, um, if you guys are familiar with Gilmore Holmes, the Freddie Gray Rice and everything, 
Um, that's exactly where I'm from. Um, my sister used to date Freddie Gray, um, but I'm here on the behalf of just doing a bunch of nonprofit work in Baltimore City and our low-income community. And due to efforts, I was able to link with some people at University of Maryland. And they always bring me aboard on great opportunities and stuff like this. So I'm just happy to be in front of you guys today. And I hope you guys can learn something from me. <laughs> so I'll start the, the first question. Um, do we have somebody that for the audience that going to be going to be right? OK, so anybody that feel, wants to you know, answer this, please feel free, OK? You don't have to use your inside voice, OK? <laughs> what traumatic experiences are you familiar with, either through your personal experience or through the experience with others? Um, Danita? When I was young, I was molested by um, a friend, supposed to be a friend of the family. Uh, my mother has been molested, and my grandmother has been molested. Yeah. So. Certainly a cycle. Okay. So this is a personal experience. I lost my father at the age of five to gun violence due to a family member. And I just lost my mother recently, April 12th, to pancreatic cancer. So oh. I'm Sorry. dealing with a lot. Yes. Go ahead, Jacob. Get the mic, baby. Um, how y'all doing again? Um, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. A traumatic experience um, I experienced um, real quick. Um, I don't want to get too much into detail, but if you guys are familiar with like guns, like, all right, it's an automatic rifle called a Mini Draco, and a Mini Draco can hold up to 50 to 100 bullets. Um, long story short, wrong place, wrong time. Um, I didn't actually like felt like the heat from these like bullets fly past my head and there's nothing I was involved with. It, like I said, it was just wrong place at the wrong time. Anything could happen. So just got to be super cautious. And that's a situation right there that I, I, I've been through a lot of my life, but it's just certain stuff that catch you like, boom, like, oh, shoot, like that was close. And earlier you said um, on the board, I saw something say re-trauma being re-traumatized. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I can get into detail later about how that situation right there got worse once like police and everything got involved. So but that's a crazy situation right there and it got a lasting effect on me, ducking bullets and you don't even know like what's going on, who doing it or why it's going on. So um okay. So for me, the reason why I was brought up in a single parent household is because um, my father actually is, um, he has PTSD, and because of that, he started using. So, um, yeah, he's been in and out of my life, most of my life, and yeah. Hello again. Uh, the reason I was called to speak here is because of the domestic violence that I've experienced in my family. Not only that, but uh, child violence as well. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. And, and so, so just listening to just five individuals here, we heard about domestic violence, right? Which we know is traumatic for children, all, you know, as well as the, the person, the victim as well. You know. PTSD, a lot of our veterans and a lot of people that experience trauma, exactly, has the, because we don't have systems that's that well in the United States to cope with um, those that are returning to our, um, and our country from, from war or, or even just not even, just even being, going through the training, they said it's just so vigorous that there's just nothing to prepare them so and that has always been drug addiction vietnam war look at all the people that came back because they were actually issuing drugs to them to help them to cope so we hear about that we hear about your father you know being killed i mean community violence and i think a lot of times we forget that community violence is traumatizing for those that are witnessing it we so focus on less Let's deal with the, the violence itself, and we should. But how are we dealing with the people, the children, and those that got these kids that got to duck bullets and, and, and be so traumatized by that? So, any questions from the audience regarding what we just asked?
not so much what was asked, but I noticed that one of the things that each of you mentioned was a, a relationship yeah. or relationships that was critical in what you're doing or how well you're doing. Can someone just speak a bit more to the power of relationships and how that's been helpful in managing some of the things you've had to go through? Okay, sure. Like relationships with people that help you like impact your life and stuff. It's just like when you go through something, you are gonna need love. That's for anybody. You gonna need love. If you don't have love, that's it. That's nothing. Love. When you got love for people, that's it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And support. That's it. Yeah, that's what. I <clears throat> Excuse me, y'all. But yeah, that's what I was about to say. Um. It, it boils down to just having that support system, just having, just feeling like somebody cares. Because at the end of the day, it's like once you feel like nobody cares about you, you start thinking on different levels of stuff like, all right, well, if nobody cares about me in this situation, well, the fact that nobody cares about me, I'm going to go do what I want because I ain't affecting nobody. Or, yeah. oh, I need $20. Nobody trying to give me no money. I've been, you feel me? It's, your mind just going make you do certain stuff because you think people don't care about you. And, having them people in your corner and everything. Like, I'm a quick story real quick. Mm -hmm. um, before <clears throat> I joined University of Maryland, um, doing work with Miss Kay and um, Miss Brittany and everybody, um, I never worked a day in my life. Um, this was about four years ago. I ain't know how to punch a clock. I ain't like, say for instance, somebody be like, hey bro, if you punch this clock, I'll give you a million dollars. That's a million dollars me and my mama just won't have, because I ain't even know what punching a clock was. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it, it just became a point, like after the Freddie Gray riots and everything, you know, um, they was hitting the CVS's, taking the um, prescription medicines, the under the counter, all types of medicines and everything. And it just was like, all right, um, the fact that nobody care about me and the fact that nobody trying to help me get no money or anything, it's just like, all right, I got connections in the street. I know these yeah. people. It's easy to do this. Yeah. Easy to do this. And it just was like, all right, I can go to these people for this type of help and they can lead me down this road. But I never had like no like universal type of help or yeah. people that actually care. So once I found out like, oh, all right, it's people I can talk to about my situation. Oh, all right, it's people that actually care yeah. about my situation. It helped me to stop thinking like short term, like, all right, I got to get this $50 right here. It started yeah. helping me think like, oh, all right, these people got money in their account. I want money in my account, yeah. you feel me? These people. So it's just all boils down to having that support system. Yeah. At the end of the day, it can change your mind in so many different ways. But just having somebody say, I love you. Yeah, you feel me? absolutely. I get, you know, that is, support is so important, and, and support don't, like you said, don't have to come from family. And you think about Leo, and you talk about domestic violence, a lot of that is we, we taught to keep it inside the house, don't tell nobody. Because your love for your parents, you don't want nobody to get told on, you, you don't want to be taken away. But where do you go to support? Did you have support? Was anybody there to give you support? So I was actually going to talk about how I believe that relationships are very important. So in my household, of course, we had a divorce, and I was, I was eight years old. Uh, when this time happened. So I kind of lost that support of who to talk to. I, right. I didn't want to talk to my mother. I didn't want to talk to right. my father because he wasn't home. He abandoned us for eight years. Uh, I didn't want to talk to my sister because it was kind of a vow of silence. Yeah. And once my stepfather came in, I just had a lot of distrust. And it only started bettering my situation when I you know, opened up to my friends and my guidance counselor yeah. on how I can be open about my emotions, what's going on, and finding help through you know, a psychiatrist and yeah. you know, just talking to people. Uh, I realized that I built a lot of distrust over that period of time. You know, kind of the term love, I didn't really, you know, believe it too much until people really showed it to me after I opened up because I didn't allow myself to kind of experience that love. Awesome, awesome. Did another question from the audience before we go to the next? Yeah. It seems like all of you are very active, and I wanted to know what is the hardest thing that you go through trying to help your friends? Um, I have grandsons I'm trying to help, and I'm out of touch with this age, so help me. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple siblings that are younger than me, and what I found that, that helps them get through what I, what they're going through, you have to find things that they like. Mm -hmm. If you don't spark their interest, they're not going to care. They're just going to shut down. 
It happened to me. If you find something that they like, like little things like Legos or playing with like their teddy bears, if that shows their interest, if that shows them that if you do that with them, it shows them that you're interested in what they want to do. And it helps them connect with you on their level when they're ready. And you can't just force it. You have to more like, like ease into it. Because if you force a child, that's automatic shutdown on them. So I learned that the hard way with my little brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and mentoring ship, finding good mentors is, is, is crucial, especially if they're teenagers. Are they teenagers? 22 or 24. <laughs> Still, more, young adults, you know, finding good and support with great mentors, you know, men that are mentors, you know, finding that that's to, wrap, to wrap around them, you know? And if you're going to take something from them, substitute it with something that they can use. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. It, 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 I learned the hard way taking something from someone and not substituting it with something they can use. So, yes, ma'am. I was just curious as to what about the person you opened up to made you feel like you could trust them? Like, how can we convey that to you? So, as she said, said earlier, she asked um, the person that you opened up to, how did that help you? Yes, okay. Oh, how did it help us? Why did you open it so, to trust So, kind of the idea Sorry. of no one asked. Uh, actually, someone asked me. That's why. Uh, so, being best friends with someone for six years, uh, one day they finally asked something, and I, you know, kind of was waiting for that question. So I told them everything. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome. Asking is very important because uh, some people won't take the initiative. And those of you that are providers, if you do ask a question, I always say prepare to hear the answer, though. You know, don't ask the question just because you want to ask a question. Make sure that you are prepared to hear the answers and be able to get them in a safe place afterwards. Okay. Ms. Kane, uh, your story showed how when you had asked a question about if someone had asked you, or asked you was everything all right or why you were doing what you were doing, so I want to ask the children, um, not the children, but the young people that are on the panel right now, have you all received counseling um, and are now getting help for any type of um, trauma that you have experienced? Good question. Go ahead, please. Oh, so when my father passed away, at the time my mom didn't think counseling was necessary because I was so young she thought I would forget. But growing up in Baltimore, it really opened my eyes Tripping. to like everybody having fathers and father-daughter dances, and that triggered something in me. Yeah. And I had a really rough teenage years. And now that I'm 18, I'm getting the right mentorship and counseling that I need to cope with the death of my father. Good. And Good. it makes it a lot easier to talk to somebody when they come to you and ask what's going on, how was your day? Um, I was in school one day, and we had to do a, we had to do like a test. Like I, don't, I forget what test it was, but it was talking about sexual molestation and all that. So I had asked one of my missus, my administrators, "Do you have a therapist?" So I went to the therapist. Ever since I met Dr. Patterson, it been good. Oh, praise God! Praise God! Praise God! There you go. Um, go ahead, sweetie. Um, my question to you guys is, um, what, can, what can we as providers do to get um, the message or build the trust with young adults so that they would be willing to tell us what's going on and not always hiding? Okay. Um, so I think something that was really important for me was um, not feeling judged because growing up, like I just had this idea, no one put it in my head, I think it's just something I cultivated myself, um, that what I went through wasn't worth talking about or especially since um, my brother, so my dad isn't my biological father, but my brother's biological father. So there'd be times where he'd come to our house and try to steal my brother and my mom would run after him and I would be left there to a neighbor and I'd be like, oh well, 
it doesn't really affect me because I'm not the one going through it and all of these things. So I think I was just afraid of someone being, someone confirming that feeling that I already felt like mm -hmm. what you're going through doesn't matter. So I think something that's really important is making sure that you tell them that there will be no judgment in meaning it because yeah. people would say that to me. They'd be like, please tell me what's going on and then immediately, they'd be like, that's not that bad, you know, that, that doesn't really, you should be fine, yeah, you don't. So that hurt me and for a long time I kept everything in and that just made it worse. And um, so when I actually did go to counseling, I actually was, it was very difficult to open up and I stopped going, so. Yeah, create that environment where they feel comfortable. Uh, I think a very key character trait to getting someone to open up instead of trust is persistence. Uh, for me, as I said before, I was kind of waiting for the question, uh, but it's very easy to say no to the first time someone asks. The second time, a little harder, and then the third time, that's when I finally broke, you know, asking. The persistence of my guidance counselor asking me, you know, what's going on, what's going on, that's when I finally opened up because in my situation, I didn't really want to open about open up about uh, domestic violence. You know, possibly having social services coming to my house, separating my siblings who really needed that mother. Uh, so, that's my opinion. Um, hi, everybody doing again? I know I said it already like five times, but um, <laughs> um, for me, um, I just find. For me, opening up to someone, all right, long, I'm going to start here. Like, you know how sometimes people can say, oh, trauma, can it, trauma is bad, you feel me? And in low-income community, trauma can be super bad, but sometimes you got to turn your bad good when you don't got, like, no other way to go. You got to make your bad good. And for me, I started, like, using my traumas to make me stronger. Like, I put it in my head, like, or example, say for instance, if it was a trap right here, and you knew it was a trap right here, uh, and one day you put your foot down and hit that trap. All right, now you know it's a trap right there, you feel me? So nine times out of 10, you're gonna walk around that trap or you're gonna tell somebody else like, hey bro, it's a trap right there, don't hit that trap. So I just started learning to myself like, all right, well, let me present this problem to this person and let me see their body actions, let me see their language, let me see how sincere they sound, let me see if they make an eye contact, because you can tell a lot from a person by their body gestures and you know what's going on in the moment. So I just trained myself, not like I'm Superman or nothing, but I just trained myself to know if somebody really care about me, you know? Because it's like, what I've been through, it's like the average person don't go through it. So you gotta like, treat it like a treasure box, because the fact that I've been through that stuff and I'm still here, you really gotta treat yourself like prize and joy. So like, being here right now, like, it, it's really nothing to me to open up and share my story because it's like, all right, I've been through it already. Somebody else in the audience probably already going through it, so maybe I can help them out. So with me, it's just that understanding, that eye contact, that, you know, that vibe. Like, I, I'm not no pushover or nothing, so I just don't, you feel? That's another story, but yeah, y'all get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, it's just that sincerity. You got to feel like yeah. that person is with you versus just right. saying, like he said, somebody can be like, yeah. so what's going on with you? Get the whole drop on you like this and be like, Oh, I right, bet like early, the lady with the check, you feel me? The way you was talking, I caught it. It's like she really didn't care, but say for as if she was talking to you like, yes, ma'am, can I help you with anything else? Then maybe, you right. feel me, the whole vibe would have been different. So it's just that sincerity and that body language and stuff, and it gets you what you need. <laughs> and I like how she talk about judgment. That's important. Um, and then being able to switch it around, because so often we as trauma survivors are told what our weaknesses are but nobody's pointing out our strengths, you know? And I had somebody that actually point out that using crack cocaine was a strength for me. I found something that could help me stay alive long enough for me to be able to find healthier tools. The fact that I was able to find something to help me to cope and numb so I would not continue to try to commit suicide was a strength. Who would, nobody ever said that before. So using telling people that what the world sees the weaknesses is actually has been a strength because like you said, you're here, I'm here. You know what I mean? So we definitely got to um, work from that perspective of people. 
That segues um, perfectly right into my question. My question is, a lot of emphasis when we're talking about trauma is on PTSD, and that's post-traumatic stress disorder. But what happens when the person cannot escape that trauma, and that trauma is ongoing? And I like to label that present traumatic stress disorder. How do you manage that? And I, I would think that because yeah. you're living in a community, you, it's ongoing for you. And all, and all of you, like you said, you had, you want to speak a little bit more about knowing you still see people, your friends, but fathers in those graduations and things like that. So that's like you being triggered all the time, right? Yes, ma'am. So, like, I find it really hard to go on with life without my dad because, like, still to this day, my friends come up, oh, my father, there's my father, that, and I can't relate to it right. at all. So when people come to me, I'll just be like, oh, well, I'm, I'm happy for you. So, like, I'll, s I'll put my, my, my mind in a different set. Like, if my father, father was here, what would he want me to say? What would he want me to do? I look through his eyes. I do everything through his way so that I know that I'm making him proud every day. So it's going to be stressful. It's going to be take time. But eventually, I'll get through it. So that's how I get That's through. coping. That's coping. That's coping. Um, and for me, it's like, um, no soft story or nothing, but I never met my father. Like, uh, I, I ain't never seen him not one time, but I did have a conversation with him on my um, 18th birthday. I didn't even know he had a Facebook, you know? And the thing was, I was like, all right, it's my 18th birthday. I'm about to take it about, I'm becoming a man. I'm about to go find out who my father is, right. you know? So I went on Facebook and typed in Michael Wills, that, that's my name. Um, and he popped up and another picture popped up. So I went on there and I'm like, all right, yeah, this guy looks just like me. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Oh yeah, he think he got away. <laughs> Facebook will find him. Facebook, that's like the FBI. <laughs> I'm telling you. If, if you're looking for a teacher that you had a second grade, type my name on Facebook. She gonna... <laughs> right, but anyway, um, yeah, so when I seen him, I'm like, yeah, he looked just like me. He got my face features right. and everything. So I inboxed him like, um, what's up, Pop? I'm, 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 <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, like, should I have a like, little sad, little soft story? Like, I miss you. Right, right. right. I'll be keeping it real, right? So I just like, what's up, Pop? Trying to be like a young adult. Right. He going to reply back like, who? You ain't my son, you feel? I, like, I'm. Le it's yeah. funny to me, you feel me? Because it's like, yeah. I already made it this long without you. Right, you, exactly. It's just like an understanding, like, hey, give me some money or something. Uh, right. <laughs> like, I ain't, you want no child support? Nah, no, the, he got, got away Scott clean. Got away Scott clean. <laughs> We're in Alabama now. But anyway, so he going to tell me, um, yeah, I'm sorry to say, but uh, I hate that I had to get in contact with you on your 18th birthday. For one, I got in contact with you. You ain't getting in contact with you. He trying to ease that. He take, take credit for that. I take credit for that. <laughs> Dang, man. So anyway, long story short, he told me, yeah, I didn't know how to tell you. That's why I wanted in your life. You not my son. Um, we just look super alike. We got the same name. But I'm like, bro, so we got the same name. He's going to say, oh, I forgot to tell you. You got a brother with the same exact name as you, too. <laughs> so I'm like, wow. So I look on Facebook, the second pitch I saw. It was your brother. He was my brother. The same name. I'm, I'm like, bro, what's your, what's your grandmother name? Valerie. Mom, what's your uncle name? Mark. I'm like, oh, shoot, so we brothers. But long story short, <laughs> I, I just look at it as it. I didn't really look at it like traumatizing me because I went yeah. so far without him, but I really didn't know him. But to answer the question about the PTSD, mm -hmm. um, you remember I was saying earlier about re-traumatizing yeah. yourself. So after um, the gunshots and everything went off, mind you, I'm still dumbfounded, you feel yeah. me? I, I see the bullets flying through the window. Like, the bullets were so close, like, I can feel the heat. Like, every bullet you can hear, I'm just thinking, like, I'm just imagining, mm -hmm. like, oh, shoot, my brain. Like, I'm yeah. just picturing my head. So... It's like, it's, you just feel every bullet hot. It's getting hotter and hotter, and it's getting louder and louder and louder. So it's letting me know, like, what's ever going on is getting closer. Yeah. So as I just get out um, the car and start running, the, they, like I said, wrong place at the wrong time, Lyft, Lyft driver, mm -hmm. in some trouble, you feel me? So as I get out and running this stuff, I still hear the boom, boom, boom. So, like, say, for instance, this a pole right here, it's like I can... See the bullet spark and go through the pole right here, like boom. 
And once that happened, I just ran and jumped the fence. But when I jumped the fence, I cut my leg. Mm. So my leg bleeding. So now I'm laying on the ground back like, oh, You've shit. been shot. I'm yeah. shot. You feel me? So my mind is taking over now. So I got a little cut on my leg, but I'm like this. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, so um, long story short, um, the Uber driver happened to call the police. Police came, found me laying in the grass and everything. Um, and the thing that confused me is they locked me up. And they gonna tell me, oh well, we don't know what you was doing or what was going on. So we um gotta take you into custody and everything. So talk to Jim. Oh okay. god. So um yeah, so they come lock me up and everything. And that's what I mean about re-traumatizing mm -hmm. myself. So they ask me what's going on. I'm telling them like, officer, I do not know. Like I was getting in the lift. Like I do not know. And he just looking at me like, oh, you young dress tattoo. Right. Oh, you lying. He telling me like, you lying. You know what's happening. You know what? You lie again. I'm taking you down. No question. So now I'm in my head thinking, like, so do I really lie? And <laughs> but I'm just thinking to myself, like, bro, I don't know what's going on. Right. So um, his captain, Lieutenant Weber, was, came in there let me go. So um, I go home. I'm in a house. I, I remember I turned on SpongeBob because after all, everything that happened, I wanted to feel like a kid that's, again. <laughs> so <laughs> that's I my go-to. That's my go-to, too. And get the um, Captain Crunch. So now I got a big bowl of cereal. As soon as I do like this, I just hear like a bomb, it sounded like a bomb went off, but mind you, I was just in that situation. Right. So now it's just like my, any, right. any little pop. And I never knew right. PTSD was so serious, yeah. but this thing is so serious. Like a knock a bark and drop on the floor. You in there like yeah. this, like, yeah. what was that? Everybody good? Yeah. But anyway, from that situation right there, um, right. time out, I mean, the police come in there, um, they had like strip wire. And the strip wire, <laughs> yeah, they put the strip wire on the door. They had the SWAT team. They had helicopters outside, everything. And it just was like, uh, am I Tony Montana? Did I really do something that I don't know about? <laughs> so um, long story short, they blew the doors down um, with the tape wire and everything. And mind you, the situation from that really messed my head yeah. up. So now it's like when that situation happened, when they blew the door down, it just like, it really like, like, I'm a strong person, and I've been through a whole, whole, whole lot. Like, I handled that um, gunfire situation. But I think when the police blew the door down, that's what really triggered, like, my PTSD. And, and I haven't been to the doctors to get professionally, you know, or nothing like that. But I really do believe that situation right there triggered it. But yeah. um, after that situation, I'm almost done. Um, I just put it in my head because after that, I just start walking around every single day like, oh, shoot. Somebody else again, I can lose my life any moment now. So I put it in my head like, I'm good, nothing happening to me. And I told myself, like, me worrying is like walking around with an umbrella on a beautiful day, waiting for it to rain. And soon as it, and soon as it start raining, now my umbrella up, now I gotta worry. So I might as well enjoy it. So I just put it in my head like, as long as I got feet and as long as my heart can beat, I'm really not going to put this situation on myself. I just gotta man up and be strong. And that's what I mean by, my trauma, my traumatic experiences made me a better person. It probably don't work for everybody, but that's what I told myself. Like, I'm not going to walk around with an umbrella waiting for it to rain. So it's easy to say it than done, but that's what it was. Okay. Okay. So I do want to get, thank, I want to get, um, because we want the audience to know about some of the things that help you guys. So what was available social support that actually helped you the most? Let's start with you. Social support. Well, as I said before, uh, the psychologist helped me a lot, uh, posing questions as to what I should do. Also, the reality of it is identifying the problem. Mm -hmm. So when you're living in a household that's every day, it's just a fight, and every day you walk into your house, your stress is just increasing drastically. I mean, you, you don't, you, you can become numb to it. Yeah. And when you're seeing movies of, you know, kids getting beaten, parents getting beaten, you think, wow, this is just reality. This is how everyone's supposed to be. Yeah. So getting professional help with social work, they really made, identified the problem that, you know, this is not normal, this is not okay, That's right. and something has to be done about it. Gracie. Could you repeat that one more time, please? <laughs> huh? Can you repeat it? Um, what, are some of the, um, what are some of the social support that help you the most? What are you, you know, what kind of social support are you utilizing now or then? Um, I guess talking to people, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, that, that could help. But 
unfortunately for me at a younger age, I didn't do that because like I said, I just had this wall. So for me, it was more um, keeping myself busy, focusing on school, which some people can do and you would never know. People always used to tell me like, everyone thought that I was rich and that um, mm -hmm. my parents were rich and everything was great in my life. And they'd be like, oh, where do you live? They didn't know where I, they knew nothing about me. So that's another thing, just to be aware of the fact that you never know what someone's going through and you never know what drives them. Like that drove me for school. And just to think about like my mom, like making her proud because she's been through all these things with my dad and with my brother. And um, yeah, so I think that's what drove me being social, trying to be nice to everybody because I felt abandoned and I just felt like I needed people around me at all times. So yeah, that's what helped kind of. <laughs> and funny, funny, funnily enough, uh, Kyrie and I lived in the same community and every <laughs> single day uh, in middle school, I'd see her at the bus stop. She had the brightest smile. I literally think she was the happiest person ever. Um, but lo and behold, we're both here now. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Shantae with the silent T. <laughs> they actually called me that in school. <laughs> so, um, I think the only thing that helped me a lot was people outside of the home. Because my dad's side of the family disowned me because they didn't know if I was his or not. It was a lot. I, I'm the only girl in my dad. Out of all 12 of my brothers, I'm the only girl. Oh, wow. They never thought he could have a girl. I popped up. Oh, that's not his child. <laughs> okay. Just recently, my uncle finally agreed to do a, I guess, a sibling uncle DNA test. Wow. So we're going to get that done. That proved everybody wrong. Yeah. But the only people that I know that was there with me through everything was my mother and Miss Mandy right here because I would cry all day and they would just hold me and tell me it's okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. They never once, oh, this is your fault. They never once judged me. They never once spoke down on me. They always encouraged me to do my best mm -hmm. and be the best version of me that I could possibly be. And you're doing that too. Um, people who helped me was my therapist, my mother, and my grandmother. Um, in God. Yes, amen. Praying. Going to church more. It's just like, I'm delivered. Like, and, and, and make a long story short, Mike. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> you know, I, I hope your situation come all through and, I, and your daddy, but I know that's my fault. But like, <laughs> like, if I just put a picture up there, he looked just like me. Like, it's a, and the brother that got the same exact name as looked just like me. So, and the funny thing is, I'm the junior, but he is the oldest one. So, oh, I don't wow. know what my father was doing, but. Well, he's doing oh, something. He's doing something. He's doing something. But, um, yeah, to be honest, what helped me in my situation was, like I said, I never had a job or anything since. My first job was 2016 at a nonprofit called Newlands. And from Newlands, I was doing a bunch of nonprofit work in my community. Mm -hmm. And I ran into Miss K right here. Miss K Connors, can we clap for her real quick? Um, and I'm going to just say, um, the thing that helped me is because I was so installed in my community, I really didn't see like past Gilmore Homes. And it just was like, once I linked up with Miss K and Miss Britt and the rest of the people at University of Maryland, they really just showed me like it's more to life than my community. Like now awesome. I'm traveling around the country. I've been to California. I've mm -hmm. been to New York. I've been to Virginia. And it's just been like, I'm just spreading the word to other people that's younger than me trying to better them. And it's just like... the. You know you're doing something good when the same people you use to run with around the way, you feel me? I'm keep it funky. The same ones that hold guns, the same ones that gang bang, you feel me? Mm -hmm. When you can go back and they can see you starting to be positive and productive, now they want to learn yeah. how to work a computer. Now they want to learn how to. So it's just like, I really do appreciate Ms. K because it's like, I'm the man of my, my community, you feel me? And it's just like all the good reasons. And 
Uh, I can honestly say, like, I appreciate Miss K and University of Maryland. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go back to the audience for a few some, some more I don't be in the hood no more. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Miss Kane mentioned the essential need of faith in her life. And I'm just curious if you could speak to either the role of faith in your life or what you believe the role of houses of faith should be in the community to make a difference uh, in, in your world, uh, in your personal life, and also perhaps in the community life. Yes, sir. Um, well, for me, I'm a firm believer in God. Um, and the structure... And the relationship for me was the most important, not necessarily like the, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. It's feeling connected to something greater than me and someone who loves me when I told myself that, oh, it's not possible. You know, people can't love me because something's wrong with me. People keep abandoning me. There's no way that that's possible. That role of faith was something so important to me. I still struggle with things. It's like, it's impossible not to think about something that was, that I had that thought process for so long in my life that it just disappeared one day. But um, knowing that I'm not alone, like even for people who aren't necessarily religious, the relationship, even with another person or, um, with something like a sport or something can really just bring you up and lift your spirit and make you feel less alone. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share? Mm -hmm. uh, I classify faith as in having faith in someone helping me. So funnily enough, I actually lost all faith in people helping me. I had an older sister, many older siblings. I, you know, thought... Why doesn't my, si my older sister go in and stop this chaos? Uh, and after my sibling, or my sister, left the house, I kind of completely gave up on faith. And I relied on myself. And that's how I stood up to the problems in my household and finally resolved them by having faith in myself and empowering myself. And to make a long story short, I'm a <laughs> short. Uh, for me, my faith came, like I said, just okay. going through stuff and yeah, just at the end of the day being able to overcome it. Um, I just put it in my mind like, like I said, I don't like to look at it as I'm super, maybe I do, you feel me? Because I've been through a lot and I'm still here. So the fact that I've been through that and I'm here in front of you guys today, it just shows me like time's going to get hard, but if you just keep rolling, it's always going to get better or it's always going to fix itself out. So that's what I mean. Um, so I just want to say really quick, someone's going to take over for me because I need to get back to my other event that I started this morning in Baltimore <laughs> County. But I want to personally say, God, I love you guys. And I, I hope you, you stay too. connected with me. And you guys are so amazing. And I look forward to having you guys work with my organization and do some more powerful work, okay? <laughs> oh, oh. That's why they thought you were rich, because you live in Napa. Thank you so much. I'm going to put a plug in for Mike, too. He's an awesome filmmaker, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing some of your work. And, okay. Okay, so as you're leaving, Ms. Kane, I was at one of your, I was fortunate to be at one of your trainings a couple of years ago, and you really changed my perspective as a clinician in terms of how we treat trauma, and you talked about strength base, and it made me and forced me to look at sort of the post-traumatic growth that we see from individuals that sustain trauma, so thank you for that. And then I wanted to go to the panel for that and say, just for us as clinicians, I think we often do start with sort of the weakness. Um, and I want to just talk about, or hear you guys, if you could just share the strength that you all acquired from your individual traumas, because I think oftentimes we talk about how it has traumatized you, but I also believe that you have gained a bigger perspective individually, culturally, as a community perspective. So can you share with us how you all grew from your traumas? So, so how I grew from my trauma was I took it day by day. I didn't worry about what was uh, tomorrow. I took it from that day. From the moment I woke up, I planned my day out. So this is what I'm going to do in the morning. This is what I'm going to do in the evening. This is what I'm going to do in the middle of the day. 
I didn't go into the future, oh, this is what I want to do in the future. No, you can't do that. Because then if something don't go right, you will blame yourself for the rest of your life. Mm. That is something that you don't want to hold against on your shoulders. So the strength that helped me was taking it day by day, maybe even hour by hour. Everybody's different. You take it at the pace of you. You don't go to everybody else's pace. You go to your pace. If you feel like you go faster, you go faster. If you feel like you got to go slower, go slower. There's no in-between. It's all up to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so not to pat myself on the back, but I think I'm a very empathetic person. And um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I think that's a very... Like, it's a necessity, basically, because for the field I want to go into, you have to have em empathy. Even if you can't personally, if you didn't experience it, you can't just invalidate someone else's experience because you didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. So um, having that, and it's like I have empathy for my father, my brother, my mother, everybody involved. It's just, that's like everybody on this panel it's just everyone's story is important so mm -hmm. yeah. I gained that at a very young age and um, I guess trying to be friendly as well I gained very personable skills because I just I was so afraid of being alone so afraid that it helped me so mm -hmm. yeah. thank you uh, a strength I received as I mentioned earlier is uh, empowering myself, really. So I plan for uh, how am I going to tackle this issue? How am I going to resolve this problem? And if others come by, well, that's great because you can help me as well uh, accomplish my goals. Mm -hmm. And another strength that came about from this experience is just the, just, the, just the magnitude of the problem. I mean, domestic mm -hmm. violence before, I was so entrenched into it that I didn't realize it was a problem. And now that I'm, you know, sought to resolve it, I really see how much of a problem it is, how much it's affected me, my older siblings, and even my younger siblings that are now growing up. Mm -hmm. So I've become sort of an educator. I've worked with the Center of Help, uh, try to help people tutor kids, and even if I stumble upon a problem as in they are having an issue family-wise, I try to bring it up with the president of the board. Wow. Gotcha. Smooth. <laughs> um, my strength, um, I received. I received two strengths. It was, it is resilience and understanding. And I say that because um, it taught me how to get through situations, and it helped me understand like life not gonna always be peaches and bubbles. So as long as you know, I can stick that in my head. <laughs> as long as I stick that in my head, then I won't be let down thinking, all right, my life gonna be great. So as long as I put it in my head, like, all right, I must, I'm, I'll probably stumble somewhere. You know, I ain't gonna say I'm expecting it, but you know, I'm just not really putting all my eggs in one basket. So I say resilience and understanding that things can go wrong so you don't be let down in the long run. Hi, um, I used to be a correctional officer at Anne Arundel County, so I can testify to Miss Kane's cray cry days. But uh, oh, wow. she was uh, here, and I got to speak to her for a minute, so that was amazing to see her transformation. Wow. Um, wow. But my question uh, for the panel and um, for everyone, actually, tell me how important it was for you in your relationship to have that heartfelt look in the eye conversation where there's no judgment and nothing but love that is at the base root for your transformation and your journey and what you do, and tell me how you got to that point and by who and how important a mentorship <coughs> mentor was in that. I got you. <laughs> um, for me, like I said, um, well, really, Miss Kay really helped me out a lot because it was like times in my life where I was confused. I didn't know what steps to take next. And then I'll just call Miss Kate and she'll just talk to me and she'll just let me know, like, well, if there's anything you need, just let me know. And a lot of the times when people say that, it just roll right off their tongue, you know, anything you need, just let me know. Then you hit them, they be like, oh, shoot, I got you next week, you know. But it's just like, um, it's good to have people in your corner that their word is their bond, so their word is solid. It's good to have people that you know you can depend on if they say they're going to come through for you. And um, for me, it was super easy because um, it's like you got to build relationships with people. 
Like, even if I was to walk up to a stranger right now, it's all about how you present yourself. Like, you can walk up to a stranger and you can talk a little aggressive and they're gonna be like, oh, I ain't trying to holler at you. Or you can walk up to a stranger and you can talk with some respect and sincerity and let them know, like, you on their page, you try to work with them. So, like I said, when I share my story with Miss K, it's just, you know, that relationship was already built. So it was just like, all right, I'm talking to someone that wants to understand what I'm going through and someone that wants to help versus, oh, I'm just talking to somebody that want to hear my problem. So it's just that understanding, that line right there of knowing who you're talking to and that relationship with who you're talking to. It'll make the situation and the conversation that much different. So I had multiple people try to get me out of my shell, mm. but only one really like scooped in there and got me out. And <laughs> once again, it was Mandy. She constantly called me, constantly made sure I was okay, even if that meant her coming from straight from work to come to my house and make sure I was okay. And I was eating and I was sleeping. If she, wa if she wanted to go out, I'd go out with her just to get out the house. It was not until after my mom recently passed away when everything started hitting the ceiling and I started getting back into my old habits. Mm. So from there, Mandy, I appreciate it to this day that Mandy constantly called me, constantly made sure that I was okay, constantly was just there. She was a shoulder to cry on, a friend when I needed her, a mother when I needed her, which was a lot. <laughs> and she was just the biggest role model that I could have ever asked for. Yeah, I'm, nobody's gonna ever replace my mom, but she comes so close to being another mother to me that it's, like, she's the first person I call when I wake up. She's the first person I text when I have great news. So I couldn't imagine her not being able to be there and me not being able to call her or text her about the great news that I get <laughs> every day. So seeing that and seeing the dedication that she's had to see me grow into the wonderful young lady that I am today, it really inspires me to do so much with my life. Yeah, I'm a little on the rocky road, but <laughs> I got this. And with her help, you gonna get this it is done. easy. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> well said. Okay. One more, one more question. Yes, my question is around one of the statements that was made earlier about having a sport or <clears throat> something that you are involved in. Do any of you have any kind of gifts or talents that you've, um, in dealing with your trauma that you've been able to use to be able to handle what's been going on, even if it's just for a short time or for that moment? And if so, can you just give us a taste? Um, <laughs> okay, um, I would say something that you should, anyone, everyone should do, honestly, is writing. So many people told me to write, and I, oh, I, don't, I don't feel like it, I don't want to, that's not gonna help me, and then as soon as I do it, it just, it comforts me to have everything that's in my mind feeling like so chaotic, writing it down and making it plain, basically putting out your thoughts on the paper, it can be a journal, poetry, anything, that helps, but, um, also, physical stuff helps as well, release endorphins and everything. So. Yeah. Uh, I have like kind of the typical thing that people do. I like to run and I like to play tennis. So I play tennis and run whenever I want to relieve stress or even just go to school. Uh, school is a very uh, relaxing place for me because I like to study. Mm -hmm. And actually, studying is another manner that I just release anything that I have just by indulging myself, myself in knowledge. Does anybody want to go? Do you want to go? Yeah. I'll go last because I got a poem since y'all. Okay, gotcha. Want he wants to see a face. Okay. Well, for me, I play um, XEFL football, so it's funny you say that because I'm up here rubbing my knuckle. I had a game Saturday and I messed my knuckle up trying to catch an interception. I dropped the ball, but it, it's all good. But um, yeah. I play football to, you know, to get over what I go through because it's like that's the only sport where you can really like, mm, and mm. so. And another thing I found, um, listening to like Motown music, like 50s, 60s music, bar music, yeah, yeah, and and like Chinese instrument um, flutes and just like meditation music, like you'll be surprised how deep your mind can think when you by yourself. So meditation if you can. <laughs> So, sorry, he said he wanted to get a taste of it. So 
I write poetry a lot, and it's more like for my feelings and stuff. So I've seen, so I see that that helps a lot more. So here you go. This was the one I read at my mom's uh, memorial. My world, my everything. I never knew hurt until I lost you. I never knew pain until you took your last breath. But that never stopped me from loving you then or loving you now. I pray every day that you've made it to the gates of heaven. I always thought that we would have forever. You were my world and my everything. I love you, mama, your youngest, Shanae. No. Oh, uh. Hold on. Danita, Danita, before we get to you, there was a question that I think might be helpful to the audience, and let me just get a quick answer from you guys. There are some people who deserve some shout outs. Mandy Memel, I'm sorry, Memel right here, Brittany Parham over there, and of course Kay, um, who have supported these people. And so the question is, how did you guys get connected with these great mentors and supporters? Very quickly. Very quickly. Long story short. <laughs> <laughs> you owe me so, $7, man. I got you. <laughs> so when, at the age of 14, I was basically doing stuff that I wasn't supposed to be doing. I was smoking and drinking with friends that I thought were my friends, but weren't. They didn't have the best interest for me. Uh, my mom at the time was a really bad drug addict and alcoholic. So I didn't care. My mom didn't care. Miss Mandy, me and my mom was walking down the street. This lady would not stop smiling, OK? I thought it was weird. <laughs> so she was like, can I pray for you guys? So I kind of kept walking, because at the time, God wasn't part of my plan. He was not even in my circle. She prayed for us. Since that day, I have been a dedicated, go uh, godly young lady that has let God in my life. God is my everything. He comes before anybody. That was meant to be. Go ahead. So someone not mentioned but was here unexpectedly is Mrs. Richburg, Kathleen Richburg. Uh, after my trip to Yale with uh, Mrs. Drayden and Mrs. Richburg, they noticed that something was off with me when I... Uh, kind of shared my stories, my life stories, and they kind of, I kind of opened up a little. And one day, Mrs. Drayden told Ms. Mrs. Richburg that, you know, something was up and to look into it. So her persistence, dragging me into her office, uh, finally got me to open up about myself. Of course, I cried about it, and it was very tough, but she was always there, and she even sought the help that I needed. Um, I met Miss Paulham by my school, but before then I met her, I was terrible. Like I used to fight every day. When I mean every day, 365 what? days a year. In my old elementary school, I used to fight every day. Like if you want a problem, you could get it. Like that type. I was that type of person. I used to lie real bad. I used to have bad grades. Now I'm on the roll. I used to do, I used to do terrible stuff. But when I met Miss Parham, she taught me like, you know, it's not your fault what you did, stuff like that. Like that's all I needed. My mother, my grandmother, my family taught me that. But by having another person outside of your family Amen. teaching you that is like amazing. So, yeah. Um. So I actually have two. One, Miss Richburg, because she's just amazing. She never once made me feel like I couldn't come to her, and um. Because of the things that happened, I have anxiety and depression. And I, high school, I used to have so many panic attacks because I would just feel like something's going to happen. Something's wrong. I don't know. And then I just feel inferior. And I would go to her. And she, she never once turned me away. She just, oh, you want to bring your work in here? You just sit in here. And um, yeah, that was amazing. And then also my pastor, um, her name is Cheryl Menendez. She taught me about forgiveness, and that was big because once I forgave my dad, that's when everything turned around for me. That's when everything, like, the weight was lifted off of my shoulders. I didn't have to feel those things anymore. So, and that's one thing, actually. Um, I know everyone always says it, forgiveness is for you, forgiveness is for you, and no one ever, like, when you're upset, you don't want to hear that. I don't want to forgive anybody. Uh, so that 
it's hard to do, but you just got to, that's where that empathy comes into play as well. Because I had to realize that he's not using because of me. It's not my fault that these things happened to him. And that's a hard thing to face when you're a kid and you just don't understand why everyone else has their dad around and yours comes and leaves and tells you he's staying and it, it messes with your head. So yeah, forgiveness and also having someone to be there for me and just let me, let me feel the emotions that I was feeling and not just tell me, oh, well, you need to go back to class because you've been out of class all day because I would be out of class all day, but yeah. <laughs> So let's go back to Mr. Campbell's question in the back, which was about your art. Donita, you didn't get a chance to respond. Would you like to? Yeah, um, I sing. Go ahead, right now. Sing to us. <laughs> oh, she's going to do it? Oh, you going to do it? Oh, yeah. yeah, you got this. Come on. Never would have made it. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all. But now I see how you were there for me. And I can say I'm stronger. I'm wiser. I'm better. Much better. When I look back. Over what you brought me through, I can see that you were the one to hold on to. And I never, I never would have made it. And I never, never could have made it without you. So another round of applause for these really amazing, wonderful, brave young people. Okay. In a minute, in a minute, we're going to go to the lunch break. Again, the unpopular one. We're going to... Um, go to your breakout sessions, which will begin at 105. So they run from 105 to 245, and they're by the cohorts that we talked about before, family and community, educators, clinicians, providers, workforce, and faith-based, and legal and law. They are, the rooms are up here, located up here. If you're going to the School of Nursing, down the stairs and around the corner, you can take the elevator to go up. Hold on one second. You can take the elevator to go up or the stairs are back here at the end of your breakout session there'll be a little break but then come back here because you've heard so much about the importance of resilience in the discussions and also from these young people and we really need to have you complete that day that way all right so there are box lunches in the hallway you can bring them in here to eat or you can proceed right to your breakout rooms thank you <laughs>